Welcome to the Barley Malt and Brewing Quality Lab. I'm Hannah Turner, Director of the Lab here at Montana State University. We're super excited you're joining us for Craft Malt Week and to tell you about our breeding program as well as do a tour through the lab and look at some of the projects that have us busy this fall. First thing, I'll hand you off to Jamie Sherman. She's down in our greenhouse and going to tell you a bit about how the breeding program supports Craft Malt. I'm Jamie Sherman. I'm the barley breeder from Montana State University and I wanted to give you an update about the breeding program in relation to the craft malt industry. So where we are is in a greenhouse in the plant growth center and this material that you see actually had its inception in the fall of last year. So let me give you a quick overview of the breeding process so you'll understand what's going on. So what we do is we select lines that are in some way different and then we make a cross to make a new line hopefully that has the benefit of both of those parents. And the way we do that is by making crosses. And those crosses that made these families were made last fall. So we choose two parents and we make a cross. And when we make that cross, that first generation, the individuals have the genetic makeup from each of the two parents mixed in that new uh, generation. And actually, all of those individuals are genetically identical because they're just, each one of them is half of one parent and half of the other parent. But then what we want is we want there to be genetic variation. So we want there to be this family created that has different uh, composites of the parents. So we can get different uh, sets of genes from each of the parents. And we do that through inbreeding. So we inbreed over four generations. We just let barley plants self like they normally do. And so then what we end up with are these groups of families that all come from one cross. So each one of these flats that's in this room comes from a single cross, um, but each line is genetically somewhat different from the rest of the individuals in that family. And so then what we can do is we can put them out in the field, we can do malt quality testing, and we can select from each family which line has the best composite of the two parents to give us what we want. What we've been looking for primarily for craft malt is to better control the speed of hydration that happens during the malt process. You know we were really excited about our release, our new release buzz, because it goes through that speed of it goes through that hydration process um, like 24 hours faster than some of the other lines that we've released. And so we're really excited about that because it could be a benefit to the craft monsters. But another interesting thing that we found is uh, Buzz also seems to have higher extract than a lot of lines that we've looked at. And so that gives us this power where you can uh, vary the amount of modification that you do and then that could end up impacting your flavor profile. So if you let it kind of over modify then you're going to get a lot more sugars and sweetness and perhaps that would be good for a specialty malt but then you can go through the malt process faster and get it modified just right and then maybe that would be a really good uh, just a normal base malt. So we think that Buzz may give us some flexibilities and we're wondering about that possibility with these lines too. So the speed of hydration we think is important and we've really been working hard on that. Another thing that we've been working on is flavor and we've done a whole bunch of work looking at old varieties, varieties that have been used uh, over a number of years and we've found that there are chemical differences and now what we're really interested in is seeing if there's an interplay between those chemical differences and the level of modification 
the sort of malt process we go through, and then ultimately the flavor of that malt. And so to be able to do those sorts of studies and make them be genetic, you have to work on a genetic population. So we need these populations that are varying for these traits, for example, varying for the speed of hydration, or varying for different chemical compounds. And then we can figure out from that population what is the genetic control of that uh, chemical component or the speed of hydration. And then we can then ultimately use that information to help us uh, create a new line and a line that has very specific attributes that would be an advantage to the industry. Now we're in the seed room at MSU and the seed room shows us that even though the field season is over, we're not done with our work. So what you see is bags of seed that was, were harvested uh, just a couple weeks ago and now they're going through the processing step where they have to be cleaned, we get yield, we get plumps, we get test weight, and then they go over to the malt lab. So it's late September here in Montana and harvest has just been completed. All of our program, which encompasses about 13 people between Jamie Sherman, our breeder, uh, myself here managing the lab, and we've also got another manager over on the seed side of the program, uh, a few assistants, uh, undergraduate, graduate and PhD students. Um, everyone's all hands on deck getting things processed from harvest. The first thing that we do here, we run protein on it. So we've got our NIR here, uh, which is gonna evaluate both moisture and protein. And based off of those protein values, we'll make some final selections, make sure that we're comfortable with what's gonna go into the malting process. And from there, we head to the malter. So here we are at our malters. We have CLP malters out of the UK. Uh, incorporated in this, we've got three separate steep germ tanks. They're all identical. Um, in these tanks, we load individual cages. Uh, these cages are able to hold four samples in each, and then four cages go per steep tank. So typically, our malting scale is we load about 120 grams of barley into each one of these quadrants. That makes it so that we're able to malt 16 samples a batch, uh, so close to 50 samples a week at that scale. We also have a method um, that really improves our ability to make selections for the breeding program in our early trials. Uh, and that's a PICO scale, where we actually load about six grams of barley into one of these loose leaf tea balls. We can fit six of those per quadrant, and that gets us up to close to 300 samples a week that we're able to malt at that scale. Uh, so these tanks or cages just load down into the tanks. Uh, in the tank, we do both our deep and our germination phases. Uh, two days deep, we're able to fully control when the water comes in, what the temperature is. Uh, we're able to aerate with both moist and dry air. And then we've also got turning rollers in the bottom so that we're able to turn those cages and keep them all evenly treated. So about two days in steeping and then about four days in our germination phase. So the cages cover the two scales, the pico at six grams and the micro at 120 grams. But we've also got a third scale that we're able to do with these tanks. Uh, so we have these false bottoms that slip down right into the bottom. And then that allows us to malt up to about eight kilograms per batch. And that's really been beneficial as we're moving into the brewing side of our program. It means that we're able to take barley all the way from the initial crosses um, through the full breeding process. And then some of our elite lines were able to malt in these large scales and then actually brew uh, with malt that we've brought up through our own process. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, so once the samples have finished in that six days, roughly in the steep and germination phases, the last step is that the samples come over to our kiln. Uh, so in the kiln, uh, the tea balls are actually loaded into a cage similar like this and that cage is able to go directly into the kiln. Our 120 gram micro samples go into individual tubes and then are dried that way and our large scale actually go into a kiln bin like this. Uh, and so that kiln, um, it very well mimics what a craft maltster setup would be uh, between temperature and then also controls. Typically for the breeding program, we're going to a lager style malt, so very low, slow drying. Uh, we're trying to preserve those enzymes and that creates a good baseline for uh, selection purposes in the breeding program. 
Um, but now we're getting into brewing and we're playing around a lot more with what types of malt we're able to make. And so this kiln, um, beyond just doing certain temperature for a certain time and then kicking to the next phase, it can also uh, control based off of differentials below and above the bed. So either a temperature differential or a moisture differential and we can kick to ne next phases. And so that's made it so that uh, we've been able to make lager malts, Viennas, Munichs, caramels, uh, a lot of uh, really good control and variation that we're able to get out of this kiln. So we're, we're pretty happy with this system overall. Um, so about a week that it takes for samples to go through this process. Uh, now that we've got harvest coming in, these malters are booked up where we just have them constantly running. We're at a rare hour of the day where I've got one empty and I can show it to you. Um, but we'll be filling this up a little bit later this afternoon and um, it'll be about eight months before we push through all of the breeding samples and then we're able to do a little bit more uh, experimental and playing around with some things um, beyond the breeding program. So we're back in the malt lab and the first thing that we'll do is take our sample, do some hand agitation and then run that over a 564 sieve. That'll clean up the combs that were grown during the malting process. From there, we've got our sample and we're all ready to go into the analysis process. So some of the first things that we'll look at, uh, we might run friability. And so if you're interested in that test, we do actually have a pretty involved video uh, showing the process and maintenance for this unit. And the next thing that we'll do is grind up the malt. Uh, so one way to think of malt quality testing is that a lot of what we do is very similar to the initial stages of brewing. We're gonna mill our grain, mix it with water, mash it, create a wort, and then the majority of our testing will be done off of that wort. So to start off, uh, milling, we've got this Bueller disc mill. And so it's a disc mill because it's got these two discs and then based on how far apart or close together they are, that will create a fine or a coarse flour. Uh, and so we'll measure both of these samples for extract and that's another way to give us an idea of uh, what the modification process looked like during uh, our malting. From there, we'll go over to our mash bath and mix it with water and get that process started. So we're over here at our mash bath and what we'll do with this is a congress mash and so that basically just means that we're taking uh, about two hours and a temperature regime which will allow maximum extraction of that sample. Uh, so there's about five different enzymes that are responsible for the conversion of starches into sugar during the mashing process and this congress regime allows two hours and multiple temperatures uh, to really maximize that mashing process. Once finished, we weigh the samples and add water to bring them to the proper grist to water ratio. Then we bring them to the filter station. At the filter station, we time the process to gain information about the filtration rate for each sample. So once our wort has finished filtering, which is a process that takes about an hour, we come over to our density station. And there's actually three things that we're gonna measure here. Uh, first, we've got our densitometer. And so this has an auto sampler, which picks up the samples. Uh, and that's very convenient for the high number we're running each day. Uh, but this machine will pick up that sample, run it through a very fine hand-blown glass tube. And then a vibration on that tube will give us an idea of how dense that sample is which is essentially is a measure of the soluble sugars and uh, other soluble aspects of the grain that went into the wort during the mashing process. We'll also look at turbidity or the haziness of the sample. And so uh, these are some standard uh, for calibrations, but it gives you an idea of how uh, the differences you might see in a malt go. Um, so this machine just works off of light. It passes light through the sample. And if that light is obstructed or not, it's able to calculate that into a turbidity value. And then the final thing that we look at this station is our pH. Uh, and that also can be very telling for a maltster uh, how their process went, if they had proper aeration uh, and whatnot. From here, we'll go over to our gallery analyzer and collect the remainder of our malt quality analysis methods. So here we are with our gallery analyzer. Uh, this machine is a big part of what we do in the lab. We still have about five or six different tests that we're gonna be looking at on our wort. So we're looking at things like beta-glucan, soluble protein, free amino nitrogen, uh, the enzymes, alpha amylase, and diastatic power, and we're also gonna look at color. This machine is able to do all of that testing. When we first started the lab, we looked at uh, time-wise, was it more cost-effective for us to do the typical bench chemistry methods for these tests or to get something automated like this? 
And the bench chemistry for the typical number of samples that we run in a day, which is about 32, uh, back to back, all of those tests, it was more than 24 hours to be able to run that analysis. And that didn't even include the uh, data entry at the end of the day. Uh, so this machine, it's basically a spectrophotometer with the automation of pipetting and mixing. And so we're able to program into this machine what the chemistry is, what the timing, uh, the volumes and whatnot. It does all of that internally. And then at the end of the test, based on a color change, it's able to give us a measure of something like alpha amylase. So for example, alpha amylase, uh, this test runs off of a principle where if you mix starch and iodine, you create a really dark, deep purple color. If you take uh, your sample and mix it into that, and it has a lot of alpha amylase, which alpha amylase is responsible um, for the major breakdown of starch into sugars, uh, you'll lose that purple color with alpha amylase mixed in there. So if your sample has a lot of alpha amylase, you have a lot of loss of that color. If you have low alpha amylase, it's a less loss of that color. And so this machine is able to calculate how much alpha amylase is there based on that type of color change. Uh, this machine works off of a really small volume, so just a mill of sample. Uh, this means that we're able to test not only our typical 120 gram samples as we discussed earlier at the Malter, but it also makes it for the T-ball method where we're only working with six grams to begin with and we get a very small amount of wort off of that sample. Uh, this machine is able to measure both of those uh, sample volumes based off of just this mill and provide us the same data no matter the scale that we're working at. Uh, this machine is also really great because it has a lot of flexibility to it. It's an open system and so if we have other tests that are based off of that uh, color change principle, we can likely program it into it. It also has a lot of background in things like water chemistry and soil chemistry and so if there's other things that we're interested in uh, outside of uh, the tests that I've already listed, we're likely able to either program it or find that uh, chemistry already available for it. Um, some other things that we're able to run off of this are things like Dawn. Uh, we've also programmed it for a low alpha amylase sensitivity, and so we're able to use that for uh, evaluating pre-harvest sprouting rather than using something like falling, falling Number or RBA, which are a bit time consuming to run. Uh, we're able to measure alpha amylase at very low levels and evaluate pre-harvest sprouting. Uh, so this machine is really critical to the work that we do here at MSU. Another thing that I'd like to talk to you about is in this room, it's not just the breeding program, but we also have experimental material. Remember I talked to you about those populations that we created and then we can do malt quality analysis and then on top of that genetic analysis. And there's actually two experiments right here. This is the experiment where we're looking to understand the genetic control of roots, root length, and as a maltster, you might think, well, why would I care about that? Well, if we've got a better root system, we're going to be able to grow barley in drier environments. And the amount of water the barley gets impacts its quality. So we're hoping that bigger root systems will give us a more sustainable malt quality, more stable malt quality. And then here's a rack of another genetic population that's actually varying for the speed of hydration and some other important quality traits. And so this room, everything that was out in the field ends up coming through this room. One last thing I'd like to talk to you about is we have off-station nurseries. So when we talk about the stations, what we're talking about is research centers and they grow material for us and provide us data and seed back. And we have a video on our website that gives you more information about those research centers. But the people at the research centers also help us by actually planting the most advanced lines on growers' land. So just because it does well in Bozeman, just because it does well in the research centers, doesn't necessarily mean it will be uh, good for the growers. And so we actually test our final test is on grower's land, which is really important. And we've done this for a long time with agronomic data, but now we're also um, able to test a number of locations for quality data. And we thank the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee for funding this effort. So the idea is maybe a variety has really good quality in a certain location, 
but in another location, another variety is better. So we wanna look across locations on growers managed land and see how well the malt quality does. And it's also giving us an idea of the variation in malt quality, the stability of malt quality, which could be very useful for uh, maltsters. So we're hoping that this information will empower growers to understand the varieties they're growing better. It will help maltsters select varieties for a specific location so that it will uh, do well and give them the quality that they need. So the last project that I want to tell you about, we're pretty excited about. Uh, we're actually able to start brewing in the lab now. And so this is all through funding that was provided by the Brewers Association. Uh, with a previous grant, they were able to uh, allow us the funds to purchase this SS BrewTech system. We've purchased a system that we feel very well mimics what craft brewing embodies between the movement and the control and the automation of this system. And so currently we're working on a trial that's also funded by the Brewers Association in which we're hoping to tease out uh, aspects of flavor from malt. So typically we always think of flavor coming from the type of kilning that we've done on a malt, but we've forgotten a little bit about how does variety play into it and how does the modification level play into it. We know that variety and other aspects of agriculture is a big thing between you know, hops for something like apples. So you think of a pink lady versus a Granny Smith. They're very, very different apples. They've got different attributes and different uh, flavors and qualities to them. But in malt, we've always thought of the flavor coming from the kiln and that's kind of glazed over some of the other aspects of the process. Uh, so we're taking this trial where we're malting several different varieties and we're malting them to different levels of modification, so pulling them out of the germination phase at different levels uh, to tease out um, how that part of the process is playing into flavor. And then we're also malting all of this in several different kilning uh, trials. So we've got a lager malt, we're also doing a Munich style, and then a caramel style. Uh, and then at several levels, we're looking at the flavor profiles of these. Uh, so we're, we've malted the first round and done all the quality analysis. It's now down with Colorado State University where they are doing the sensory portion of this. Uh, they'll look at the metabolomic profile, so giving a chemical profile to all these different malts, and then also doing a sensory panel. Uh, based on all that data, we'll narrow it down to a few varieties, maybe one modification level uh, and a couple different kill methods. Uh, we'll then malt that at a larger scale, as you saw earlier in our malters, we'll malt that eight kilogram batches, uh, and then we'll be able to brew with it. And with those beers, we'll again look at sensory data, look at metabolomic data, and see if we can uh, find any trends or patterns, see if we can start to tease out how it is that the level of modification and the variety that you're using is playing into that final flavor. We think that this information can be really important for craft malt. Uh, it means that you as a craft maltster can go to your brewer and have that conversation of what variety, what is your process, uh, more information that allows them to play into their palate of making unique beers. And that's what craft's all about. So thanks so much for joining us, guys. Uh, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out. Uh, email is always available. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram as well. Thanks so much, guys. Wow.